Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, I have another product review for you guys. We'll be taking a look at the Signal Hounds Real Time Spectrum Analyzer, the BB60C model, which is a 9 kHz to 6 GHz spectrum analyzer with 27 MHz of analysis bandwidth. I'm also going to take a look at their tracking generator, specifically the USB 124A, which is a 12.4 GHz tracking generator and works with this particular spectrum analyzer and all the other spectrum analyzers. One of the many interesting things that, that I want to cover is all the capabilities that you can have by combining these two units and also all the capabilities of the spectrum analyzer by itself. And a lot of people who are considering buying a real-time spectrum analyzer that's USB based are probably comparing it with the Tektronix RSA uh, 306, which I reviewed in one of my previous videos. And it happens that Tektronix has made some uh, very nice improvements to this model and I upgraded software as well as the calibration on this unit. I'll go over that. So I'm going to draw some comparison between this unit and the Signal Hound real-time spectrum analyzer as well in some of the experiments so you can get an idea of uh, how these things actually stack up against each other. So there's a lot of experiments to go through. I'll be focusing mostly on this one and whenever necessary I'll show you some interesting um, stuff about the RSA as well. So let's go. So I want to briefly go over all the products that Signal Hand has to offer so we can get an idea of where this review sits in their overall product lineup. So the unit that I'll be looking at is the BB60C Spectrum Analyzer, which is the only real-time spectrum analyzer that they have to offer that has 27 megahertz of instantaneous bandwidth. And it comes in two flavors. Option one simply adds uh, extended temperature in case you need it. But the one I'm going to be taking a look at is this one sitting at $2,879. They also have traditional spectrum analyzer that go all the way up to 12.4 gigahertz again in two flavors one of them has a 10 megahertz uh, precision time base included but the, the one without it sits at two thousand dollars i don't have that unit here but if you're interested in a high frequency spectrum analyzers this would be one for example to take a look at as far as tracking generator i have in the lab here the usb tg 124a which is a 12.4 gigahertz tracking generator sitting at about twelve hundred dollars they also have lower frequency tracking generators and spectrum analyzers ranging uh, up to 4.4 gigahertz they have another product which i would be really interested to get my hand on and that's the vsg 25a vector signal analyzer it's just under five hundred dollars and it's capable of generating modulation complex modulations up to two and a half gigahertz this would be a very interesting unit uh, for a super heterodyne transmitter, for example, as a first stage IF. So I would be very curious to get my hand on this and uh, play around with it. But anyhow, they also have RF probes and so on, which you can get to, that works with their products. But all the tracking generators work with all the spectrum analyzers, of course, up to the frequency range of either the spectrum analyzer or the tracking generator. But I'm pretty curious and interested to try these two uh, that we have here together and see what they look like. All right, and here we have the two units. At the bottom, we have the BB60C 9 kHz to 6 GHz real-time spectrum analyzer and RF recorder. And at the top, we have the 100 kHz to 12.4 GHz uh, TG124A tracking generator. And these are, of course, compatible with each other. Now, one of the very first things I noticed when I received this was how nice the build quality was. These are professionally built, intended for usage in, in labs for characterization, automation, and so on. And I'm really, really impressed with the build quality. And these are made in the United States which of course I always support. A lot of attention to detail, Signal Hand clearly has made these uh, to last for a long time and to be presented as a professional product, which they are. And uh, for example, one of the little issues that uh, this thing doesn't have rubber feet, so you know it can slide around, no problem. They include little rubber feet for you so that you can put them on so that they don't slide around on the table. So again, attention to the little details which may uh, influence the user experience. And I really like the build quality, so my thumb up on that, very nice. Now in the front of this unit, uh, interestingly enough, they've opted to use an SMA connector as opposed to a type N connector. This is a little unusual because a type N connector is the industry standard, particularly for outdoor use because of its ruggedness. But um, it's not a big problem. In fact, it might be easier to use the SMA connector in many cases inside the lab because it's more widely available and is a smaller connector. But uh, it is something to consider if you are concerned about the ruggedness of the unit. Now the the, uh, there is a ready and busy LED in the front, of course, which gives some visual feedback to the user. And the input is, can be, is protected up to 16 volt DC, so the decoupling at the front can up, withstand up to 16 volts. And even though it says 20 dBm of maximum input power, that's for the damage level. In reality, it's, it's only spec up to 10 dBm, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, you're not supposed to put more than 10 dBm in it, and its uh, specification limits you to 10 dBm. But which may or may not be a problem in case you do want to put signals larger than 10 dBm in there, you'd have to use an external attenuator. 
And at the back here, we have the 10 megahertz input and output, which is a BNC connector, and the one pulse per second input for the GPS, as well as the trigger and synchronization. This is a multifunction uh, port here and the USB uh, 3.0 connector at the back. This, uh, just like the Tektronix RSA, is fully powered from a USB 3.0 and that uh, does handles all the data communication directly through that. And uh, this is a little bit different than the tracking generator because the tracking generator does not require a USB 3.0 connector. It only uses a USB 2.0 because it doesn't have to handle too much data in and out. And again, it is also powered fully from the USB 2.0. It also has a 10 megahertz reference in and out as well as the tracking generator synchronization which then connects to this unit so that they can work together, which is quite nice. And the front looks almost exactly the same. One thing to note is that it is zero volt DC, which means that it's uh, most likely DC coupled. So you cannot put any DC voltage on it running there. Chance of damage it and an LED in the front uh, for uh, giving you feedback and so on. So both of these are very, very nicely designed. I, like I said, I like the design quite a bit. Now, if I were to compare that to the Tektronix RSA 306, the Tektronix uh, design is clearly intended to be more rugged. It has a rubber uh, case on the, on the outside, which I really like. It's also very, very solid. Um, it perhaps might be uh, further moisture protected. It's intended for outdoor usage as, and you can see, they use a type N connector with this uh, rubber thing, which is quite a bit difficult to take off. Uh, the, here's a type N connector, and they use this, you know, to protect it from dirt and stuff to get into there. And one of the advantages, or one of the additions uh, that Tektronix has done, and the rest is the main reason why I'm showing this, is that they have gone ahead and put screw terminals on each side of the USB 3.0 connector with a new cable that has the screws on each side, so that when you plug this in, you can screw these closed, and it will stay in. And this is a simple but a very very big improvement because this thing can easily get unplugged especially if you're outside and you're a technician you're carrying this around on your belt and so on if this comes out and your connection is lost and you have to do everything again nice addition also protects the connector from bending and breaking and of course if you break the connector then you have nothing because this is fairly fragile and that's something that i hope signal hand will also implement uh, one, another one of the little advantages that the Tektronix has is that it is rated up to 40 volts, so it can take higher DC voltage, and also it is rated to accept up to 20 dBm of input signal. So it has a higher dynamic range on the input signal uh, portion uh, being able to accept. But anyhow, we're going to go over a couple of other comparisons uh, as I go along, but this is the improved version of the Tektronix one with the newly calibration, uh, calibrated routines and so on to reduce spares and the new uh, USB connector. But anyhow, when I, another thing I want to show you is I want to show you the block diagram of what this guy actually is as well as the circuit that's inside it. So a little quick teardown and the operation uh, inside before we go ahead and turn it on and play around with it. Well, here we have the block diagram of the spectrum analyzer, and this is a super heterodyne architecture as it is very common with spectrum analyzers, and also the Tektronix uh, uses a similar uh, super heterodyne architecture as well. So at the very front end after the RF input, there's a variable attenuator, and then the output of that is fed into a high IP2 preamp. And the reason they call it a high IP2, high second order intercept point, uh, front end is because they're using a, a strictly a differential architecture to reject second order harmonics as much as possible, and that's why they are emphasizing that. You can see that they have balanced uh, structures with transformers at the input and output and so on. And they, they're breaking the uh, signal into multiple bands. Again, that's also a common technique. Here's a 3.8 gigahertz uh, high pass filter band. There is a 0 to 20 megahertz version, and a 10 megahertz to 4 gigahertz, and also a straight uh, preamp off uh, output that goes onto an auto leveling attenuator, which then automatically levels the signal coming out of the of the preamp and that is selected into two outputs either from 10 megahertz to 6 gigahertz or from 9 kilohertz to 20 megahertz and they do this because if your signal is below 20 megahertz for a real-time spectrum analyzer which has 27 megahertz of uh, analysis bandwidth you can just digitize that signal directly there is no reason for you to go through any signal conversion after that they're going to go through a whole bunch of different filtering and they've paid a lot of attention to this and they're really really trying to bring the spurs down and they've done a really good job as we will see in measurement and their uh, their spur rejection is is very very good and they have here a 1.26 gigahertz notch a 2.4 gigahertz notch in order to reject the residue LO left by these uh, mixers at when your signal is really really close to those uh, LO signals themselves so they've 
taken care of that quite well. And again, a whole bunch of uh, different types of bandpass filters and low-pass filters and so on before the signal is fed onto the first converter uh, with its first LO. And the output of the first converter, the IF, then goes again through a whole bunch of soft filters and amplified and other soft filters. They're just really, really killing it, making sure that they get rid of every single uh, spur and then followed by that again a second converter with another LO and a second IF filter which is a 140 megahertz soft filter again amplified another filter again so uh, the disadvantage of filtering and amplifying filtering and amplifying is typically that boils down to whether you know you, you're reaching a noise floor but if you're not then of course you can continue to improve your spurs and so on and output of that is fed to an ADC and they're using dithering on the ADC a classic uh, technique again to reduce spurious free dynamic to improve the spurious free dynamic range of the ADC and they say that this architecture of their ADC has more than 70 dBc of uh, spur rejection, which is great. And of course, that, that is more than the spur rejection of the system as a whole, so you're not limited by the ADC performance. And you can see a separate path here with a 24 megahertz low pass filter directly going onto the ADC, which is the, the path that's taken out of here. Output of that is 14-bit uh, ADC coming out, processed by an FPGA and a USB interface, which then creates a whole bunch of uh, connection with the packets of data and so on going into the computer. So this is a very, very nice architecture, obviously, and they've learned from uh, previous iterations to make sure that they can create something that gives you very, very good low spur performance, and uh, that's one of the things we're going to observe. So what does all of this look like? Well, it looks like this. Here I have the board that sits inside our spectrum analyzer. This is a separate one they've sent me, so I don't have to take uh, that one apart. And this is a two board design, and you can see that these two boards are sandwiched like this together. And I don't have any of the cans that protect the different RF sections and so on, just the boards themselves, but obviously uh, by investigating and looking at the, uh, the, uh, the PCB itself, you can clearly see where different cans and shields and so on would be placed. And I have to say, this is a really, really beautifully designed board. There are absolutely no mistakes on it. They followed all the uh, typical and good RF design practices on this. And this is why they get such good performance out of this. And I'm not going to go into too much detail of exactly step by step what every component is. I think that would be a little bit of a waste of our time at this video, maybe in, in a different, different video, but you can clearly recognize you know, the different sections. For example, this front end section is obviously uh, the, the, all the components that are here, the amplifiers and transformers, and you can see two of the high frequency transformers here, and the input signal, which obviously comes through here, and the different sections, different converters, and so on. And at the very, very end of this, you can see that we have a connector here that then goes down through the center of this port to the other one. So this is the only uh, port where RF signal is passed on. And I think that probably is after the first IF. If I'm not mistaken, it could be also after the second IF. But anyhow, I haven't, like I said, I haven't looked too much into detail on this. I don't think it would be a good usage of our time. And here at the bottom left, you can see some DC-DC converter circuitry, uh, some uh, more mini circuits components, and perhaps some mixers and so on on this level. Now, I can go ahead and separate these two boards from each other. First, we can go ahead and, and, and pop this connector off. There we go. So we can separate those two from each other and then go ahead and, and separate these boards again like so. Now these, uh, these boards obviously will be separated by spacers when they're in the final product but here they're just uh, sitting on top of each other. So we can go ahead and get this one out and here we go and now we see some more familiar components here at the bottom. Here's our Xilinx uh, FPGA that I mentioned. Here's the USB 3.0 chipset from Cypress. Here's our A2D converter sitting right here, some soft filters and so on here. Uh, you can take a look closer here to see some of the part numbers on these components in case uh, you might be interested in. But just look at how nicely this is designed. Clearly uh, done by RF engineers. Tons and tons of uh, VO stitching. Uh, nice design, no mistakes whatsoever. And you can see it has a date code here at the bottom, uh, copier 2014 test equipment plus. Very nice design, I like it. And uh, if you're worried about the stability of this connector, this is obviously screwed in quite tight onto the chassis itself, but the, the point of contact here obviously is not supposed to uh, provide too much strength. Um, you can see the decoupling cap right there. So this is the, the center pin coming out of there. So anyhow, so I just wanted to give you a quick look at this so you can appreciate how nicely this is designed. And uh, perhaps I will do a different video, a different tutorial on, um, on microwave circuits on PCBs at a different time. Uh, not now, I'm more interested in turning it on and showing you some experiments. First, taking a look at some comparisons, some basic measurements, and then some more fancy experiments. So let's get some direct comparison between these two units. On the left, I have the BB60C from Signal Hound, and on the right, I have the Tektronix RSA306. And this is the new 
Power State 306 with the improvements that I will go over and one of them I already showed you that is the improved uh, USB 3.0 connector with the uh, uh, locking mechanism but uh, and both of these are connected to two identical surface computers and this way the differences between the computers will not come into play and affect the software in any way so what I have also done is that I have a signal coming in which is split using a 60B splitter between the two units using identical cables so the signal coming into both of the units is also identical and I'm running both of the softwares at the same time and I have currently set the softwares to exactly the same setting one thing to note is that the surface is only a single USB 3.0 connector so I cannot power on the signal hound directly from the surface because it does not it does not provide sufficient power for it unlike the 306 which only requires just as much power as a single USB 3.0 can provide so what I've done is I've split this and I'm taking some power from my desktop computer but the processing is being done on the surface uh, computers as you see here so all the settings and the software is the same and one of the very first things to notice is look at the difference in the sweep speed obviously the the, uh, the signal house sweeps significantly faster it sweeps from 9 kilohertz to 6 gigahertz in about 200 milliseconds it takes the Tektronix RSA 306 for the same uh, span at the same resolution bandwidth quite a bit longer uh, to, to, uh, to scan but look at how remarkably flat and well calibrated this frequency response is. This is quite amazing as you can compare, for example, the signal hand, which is all these notches and, and jumps up and down um, between the different bands of frequency and so on. The, the new Tektronix RSA 306 uh, has this new calibration which almost essentially uh, eliminates the tones that used to be the harmonics that used to be in the spectrum by having shifted the IF frequencies and they do that uh, if you have already purchased the Tektronix RSA 306 they can apply that calibration nonetheless for you and correct those uh, harmonics and as you can see uh, you can only barely see some of the harmonics that, that uh, this unit has here so they've done significant improvement on that, which is a, which is quite important because I was I wasn't very happy with the last version. But anyhow, now you can see a direct comparison. I can go ahead and enable the signal, for example, like this, and you can see that signal immediately because this is sweeping so fast. But this one is going to have to go through everything before it shows up. And you can see the second harmonic of it here, and you can see the second harmonic of the signal here. The harmonic performance of the signal hand is still marginally better. Uh, you can see that it doesn't have, for example, tones in this region, whereas you can see small ones. But if you look at this, this is minus 60 dB, and this is also minus 60 dB. So the noise for performance of the RSA 306 is actually better. And not just that, the RSA 306 has a larger overall dynamic range because it can accept higher power. So there are some advantages and disadvantages between these two units as far as harmonics and, and the maximum input level power are concerned, which is something for you to take into consideration. But other than that, there is another major difference between the, the way these two units handle data. So the signal hound has the capability of catching signals which are very, very small, potentially much smaller than 100 microsecond. And the reason for that is because they have fast overlapping FFTs. So what the signal hound is doing is that by overlapping their FFTs, it can catch events which are much shorter in duration. The RSA 306 can capture events with a 100 probability of intercept that are only a hundred microseconds or larger but there is also another difference between these two which you should consider even though the Tektronix 306 cannot capture signals when it's playing live uh, perhaps as small as the signal hound one if you were to record the data and play it back the Tektronix 306 actually captures all of the data, raw data and all corrected um, IQ data into your hard drive and when you play it back you have a much much finer resolution and you have much more data available and therefore can capture events that are much smaller than 100 microsecond. The reason for that is that the software only processes as much as it needs to in order to guarantee a POI of 100 microsecond but it captures much more data than it needs to. The signal hound does not record anything more than it's displaying. So if you record something with the signal hound and play it back, you're not going to be able to get more resolution than what you get the first time around. That's not true for the R306. Again, this is an advantage and disadvantage situation because you have a better chance of catching something uh, right off the bat at the first try with the BB60C, but you have a better chance of catching uh, other signals if you record them and play them back. Both of these now support IQ streaming. The RSA 306 didn't have that feature, but now it does. 
which can uh, which can of course be uh, has an has its own API can be plugged in and you can write your own code just like you can do with the signal hand. So it's interesting that there are some ma you know ma ma major and minor differences between these two units which you really should take into account when you want to make a decision on which one will suit your application. But of course the bigger bandwidth, the 40 megahertz analysis bandwidth of the 306 over the 27 might be a deal breaker for some people. If you need 40 megahertz of analysis bandwidth, then you're not going to get that from the signal hand. But if you need this fast sweeping, if you need better harmonic performance, or if you need the, the fast overlapping FFTs, then of course this is going to be the unit for you. And I'm going to go through a whole bunch of different experiments so you can see the differences uh, better, but I'm going to mostly focus on, on the review of uh, the BBC but I wanted to give you an idea of what the differences between these two are right off the bat to familiarize ourselves. So let me show you a little bit better the harmonic advantages of the signal hand. So what I've done here is I have reduced the reference level to minus 50 dBm and I've reduced the resolution bandwidth to 100 kHz and I've done that on both of them and they are exactly set up identical again. This line here is minus 90 dB and this line here is minus 90 dB. You can see that on the other side 306 we have harmonics peaking over minus 90 dB but we do not have that on, on the RSA here. You can see the harmonics are significantly smaller. They're all, all well below 90. So the, especially at very low input powers the signal hands harmonic performance is quite a bit better uh, than the RSA 306 but this is a huge improvement than the original version but significantly I uh, still this is significantly better for very very low powers. At the higher powers it doesn't really make too much of a difference. For example here let's say I'm, I'm going to put a signal at minus 80 dBm and I'm going to enable the signal and you can see the minus 80 dBm signal right here which is uh, of course attenuated by the 360 dB and so on so it's much smaller than minus 80 and you can see that signal over here and that signal over here is not above the harmonics but in the case of the signal hand that signal is clearly above the harmonics see if I turn that signal off you can see that this that one disappears and you have to wait for this to sweep over and once it sweeps over you can see that that tone will, will go away there it is and that was where our tone was so that tone was actually lower than our harmonics in this case that tone is significantly larger than our harmonics so indeed there is especially a low input power the harmonic performance of the signal hand is quite quite excellent all right here's the setup of our next experiment in the experiment i'm going to use the signal hand real-time spectrum analyzer to analyze a wireless link between two transceiver modules seen here and here. I'm going to use the real-time spectrum analysis capability of this to understand how this wireless link works. Now these two transceiver modules uh, which are RFD 900 plus are 900 megahertz frequency hopping spread spectrum type of transceivers and it's a little bit different from Bluetooth's adaptive frequency hopping which is a subset of that and in a sense that in Bluetooth there is spectrum sensing to make sure that you don't occupy the other ISM bands from, uh, to not be on top of a Wi-Fi signal and so on. But this is a little bit different. Frequency hopping here is accomplished by predetermined PRBS sequences inside the unit. So that's a little bit different from that sense. But let's say we know nothing about how this system works and we want to understand and capture some of the wireless packets and see what they look like and what the bandwidth is and what the modulation looks like and so on. This is a difficult problem to solve. Because of the frequency hopping nature of these transceivers, you're going to have to work hard to catch them and normal spectrum analyzers don't usually catch them. You need a real-time spectrum analyzer like the one we have here to do that. So we're going to take advantage of it. So let me explain to you a, set of, a little bit more. Each of these transceiver modules has two antennas essentially on it and uh, these are diversity antennas and the, the transceiver will automatically select the antenna that has the best reception. So in this case what I've done is that I have terminated one of the transceiver uh, outputs to 50 ohms so we're not using it and instead of using antennas between the two of them I'm actually using a coax setup in order to be able to have a well modeled a system where I can listen to only one of the transceivers even though there's live data going back and forth between them. So there's an active live link right now and, and serial data is being sent in one direction in the other direction all the time but I don't want to see the packets from both of them I want to see the packet only from one module so that I can understand one module at a time and in order to do that I'm taking the output of one of them I'm going through a 6 dB splitter and one of the output of the 6 dB splitter goes into another 20 dB attenuation and into the spectrum analyzer so there is about 26 dB of loss from the output of this transceiver module to the input of the spectrum analyzer. The other output of this splitter goes through an attenuator which right now is set to 70 dB and then goes through another 30 dB attenuator and then is fed onto 
uh, this transceiver module. So when this guy is transmitting data, the loss from the output of this to the input of the real-time spectrum analyzer is 126 dB. It's not really 126 dB because there's isolation limitations, but it's very, very high. So we have a much more loss from this transceiver to the input of the spectrum analyzer than we have from this one to the input of the spectrum analyzer. And this allows me to only look at the signal from this because the signal coming from this one will be below the noise floor. Of course, the link is active because the sensitivity of these transceivers is quite, quite good and they are putting out quite a bit of power. Therefore, they can talk to each other, but this guy can only really see the signal from one of them. And this is going to allow me to analyze this. So this is a difficult problem, like I said before, because frequency hopping is difficult to capture. And there's live data, I don't know if you can see the LED on this one blinking, but there is data going on through it. And I have the uh, signal hound spike software running on the computer. And of course, as I mentioned before, the surface has only one USB port, so I cannot power it just simply from this. I'm borrowing some power from my uh, desktop computer in order to power this guy completely. Normally you would have to have two USB ports to run the signal hand as we as I showed before. So let's go ahead and look at this uh, screen a little bit more closely and then see what we can look at. And right now it's on a default setup and I'm going to have to film this screen because I want to have to change the camera and move around and it's going to make it easier. I'll try to do my best so that the screen is clear. So let's go. And here we have the software running. You can see that it's sweeping again from 11 megahertz to 6 gigahertz in just under 250 milliseconds. And occasionally we will catch some spikes around this region. Now, these spikes are actually too big for the input of the spectrum analyzer. So whenever we catch one, there you go, it was just one that passed by. You will see a red error message saying that the input is too large. So let's go ahead and change the reference down to zero, or I should say up to zero dBm. Now, whenever we catch a spike or a frequency hop, it will not exceed the input linearity of the instrument. It will not give us a warning message. Of course, you're gonna miss almost all of the frequency hopping uh, tones there, and you're gonna miss most of the packets, and that's because the spectrum analyzer spends so little time around that frequency, and most of the time is doing all the other sweeping. So let's go ahead and set the center frequency to 922 megahertz, which is the center frequency of our radio here. And we're gonna change the span let's say down to 200 megahertz. Now at 200 megahertz, we're doing it about maybe 25 to 30 milliseconds. So it's going to catch many of the more, more of the frequency hopping, but of course, again, it's still gonna miss quite a bit of them because the instrument is still not in real time. And real time analysis bandwidth is 27 megahertz. So let's go ahead and then analysis and select real time. And now you can see a whole bunch of activity happening around uh, the 922 megahertz and that this is a the whole span from here to here is 27 megahertz as soon as you select real time the instrument automatically turns on persistence if i turn the persistence off then you can see the individual packets being captured and a very very rapid frequency uh, hopping as to be expected from a radio like this so let me go ahead and turn persistence on again. Now there are many other ways you can look at the signal to gain more insight. You can for example look at a spectrogram in 2D and the spectrogram in 2D will look just something like this. You can see all the frequency hopping very very clearly and the spectrum is fairly quiet everywhere else uh, except for when there is frequency hopping. And there's some interesting features about which we're going to get into. And we can also look at it in 3D, which is kind of fun to look at. And you can see all of our individual uh, spectrums. You can move this around a little bit to get better inside. You can put it down uh, like this here over in the center. And you can see individual packets being transmitted in time and different little individual uh, hopping between the frequencies. So this is some nice visual representation. It's going to be able to help us catch these uh, individual packets that are going. But then the question comes along, well, I want to get more information. How much bandwidth am I occupying? What is the lowest frequency of the lowest packet? And what's the highest frequency of the highest packet? I also want to know what is the average power being transmitted? All this other information that is very difficult normally to get, we can get using this software rather easily. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's, let me go and turn this uh, uh, spectrogram completely off, like so. And I'm going to go ahead and turn persistence completely off. Now we're only looking at the spectrum by itself. I'm going to go ahead under trace. I'm going to select a separate trace and I'm going to set that trace to have a maximum hold value. So what it's doing now is it's holding the maximum encounter spectrum value uh, across this entire band and it's building a spectrum. You can see sometimes there are empty spots here and that's because the modem isn't transmitting at the maximum power at all the frequency hops at all time only when it needs to. Um, but because my setup is so stable and it's only always done with coax and there is no attenuation depending on distance and so on, eventually all the packets are going to have exactly the same amplitude if you wait long enough as the maximum transmitted amplitude in order to build a full spectrum. 
There it is, that looks very nice now. Now that I have this uh, plot built up, I should be able to go ahead and place markers on this and measure the lowest frequency and the highest frequency here to find out what is the total occupied bandwidth of these modems. And that's easy to do. I'm going to go ahead and select under trace marker. I'm going to select uh, marker the trace 2 to be where I'm placing my marker. And I'm going to click the over here. And it's showing a, a marker here in a reference there. And that's because the last time I used it, I used a delta marker. But even though I preset it, it didn't get rid of that. And it's a little bit annoying because uh, every time I click, I'm not sure if I'm going to get a delta marker or an individual marker. And when I click on delta, it goes away. But I don't know, I don't know when is when, when is it actually going to give me one or when it's going to remove one. And this can be easily solved by adding a little um, marker on the button and it will solve that problem. But anyhow, I'm sure that's a very easy thing to solve. There, so let's click around over here and I can use the wheel to move the marker over there. And now I can click on Delta and it puts another one on top. And I can place that one over here. Let me see if I can move it up here. I'm using the Microsoft mouse, which isn't the nicest thing to, to do. There we go. There it is. Now you can see that between these two points, it's reporting a delta of 12.5 megahertz, which is exactly correct. The 12.5 megahertz is how much bandwidth is available to this modem for its highest frequency hop and its lowest frequency hop. And that's exactly what we wanted to see, and we can easily measure that. So what, this is only a very small part of the information. I want to know how many packets there are. I want to know what the packet bandwidth is. I want to know what the packet power is. All of these can be easily measured. So let's go ahead and reduce our span even further so we can look at an individual packet. Let's reduce that span to, let's say, 1 megahertz. Now we have to wait a little bit, and we will see that eventually we will hit all the packets that occupy this one megahertz bandwidth. Perfect. There it is. Here's our one packet. Here's our another packet. By the way, what I call packet is I'm referring to a frequency hop channel. I should really say channel, not a packet. But since we're catching packets and every packet is in a different frequency uh, center, I'm calling them that. But really, these are channels. So here's one channel. Here's another channel. Here's another channel. And they're all edge to edge and it's hopping between them. And that's what, of course, frequency hopping means. So I want to see what is the distance, what is the frequency between the center of one channel to the center of another channel. Well, I can do exactly the same thing. I'm going to click here and it's going to give me my first point here. I'm going to click on Delta and I'm going to put the other one over here. And look at that. It's telling me that Delta is 250 kilohertz. So the center channel to another center channel is 250 kilohertz. We had 12 and a half megahertz. That means we, there are 50 channels. And that's exactly correct. There are 50 channels in this frequency hopping spectrum from these modems. And I can also do something similar where I can just click over here. And I can go Delta, remove the Delta, enable the Delta again, and click over here. And you can see that the the bandwidth of the channel itself is about 200 kilohertz and the, the from center to center is about 250 kilohertz. I'm measure, making a reasonably rough measurement here, but essentially there is a, a, a maybe about 25 kilohertz of gap between each of the channels. Again, very nice and simple and easy to do this. I also want to be able to measure how much power is being transmitted. Well, that's easy. Let me get rid of the delta. I'm going to click in the center of this channel, for example, and I think I'm roughly in there in the center of that channel. Yep. And I can go ahead and click to center. And this will center that particular channel here. There we go. We ca just caught another one. And this is our channel that we are interested in. Now I can go ahead under channel power. I can say that the channel width, let's say, is about 200 kilohertz. And I can say that the spacing between the channels over here is 250 kilohertz. Perfect. And I can say enable. And now it's going to measure the transmitted power in each of these channels for me live. So you can see here it's measuring minus 64 dBm, 64 dBm, 64 dBm. That's just the noise floor of the instrument. But occasionally, as soon as a, a packet is uh, in there, it's going to measure the power of that particular channel. But this is too quick. I cannot read this at this rate. So what? No problem. We can actually record this and play it back step by step to catch a particular a channel power when it is active. So I'm going to go ahead and press record. And it's just going to tell me which directory I want. Oops, sorry, I pressed play. What I meant to say was I wanted to place record. So there it is. Now it's recording and I can wait for as long as I want. Uh, it's going to continue telling me how much space is being occupied. I'm going to wait a little bit until one of these, all the channels are used and I'm just going to stop it. There it is. It just tells me that it saved that file for me. Perfect. So I'm going to click play and I'm going to go ahead and open that file. Now it's playing what it just recorded for me. And I can go ahead and pause it and I can step through it until 
I'm satisfied that I have caught one channel. Let's say I'm going to keep going back. Actually, that one wasn't so bad. There we go. There it is. So you can see that while this channel is active, it's receiving minus 23 dBm. And that makes sense. I have about 26 dB of loss, so it's sending about 3 dBm or so, which makes sense because it's continuously adjusting its power. I can go ahead and play it again and let it play out until I see another channel. And we should see one soon. Nope, nope, that was the wrong channel. Continue to play. And we should see another one any moment. There it is. Oh, there we go, right in the center. So I'm going to play it slowly back there. Perfect. Right there. This is our center channel now being occupied. The total transmit power is minus 21 dBm in this case and minus 20 dBm. Again, there's 26 dB of loss there. It's about 5 or 6 dB of transmit power. Again, makes sense. So this is how you can clearly capture, record, replay a spectrum to give you full information on what you're looking for, which is extremely valuable because as you can imagine, as it is live, it might be very, very tough to capture and measure what you're interested in. But what about signal anomalies? There are in fact some signal anomalies in this spectrum which I'm interested in understanding and measuring. So I can get out of this measurement by pressing stop and it's going to go back and start doing, continuing doing live measurement. So let's go ahead and disable the occupied channel power and let's go ahead and increase the span all the way to the maximum uh, available. Uh, span that we can do real-time analysis on and let's look at this spectrum once again now if you pay close attention you can see that there is some weird signal appearing on this side of the spectrum which does not appear on this side so on the low frequencies there are some weird spurious tones being generated but those spurious tones actually are not present at the upper frequency of this modem and in fact if I go ahead and uh, cl click on trace one here if I go ahead and enable a 2D spectrogram, we can see once again, in fact, that here around these areas, you can see that there is indeed some spurious tones appearing, but these spurious tones are nowhere else except for these lower frequencies. So these only appear uh, on some of these channels, but they don't appear on the other channels, which is pretty interesting. If I go ahead and take a single measurement here and pause it, look, you can see this one right here. Look how much uh, bandwidth is occupying and look at the ones on this side. They're perfectly clear. And if I put this into 3D mode, we will be able to see that also. Let me zoom into here. There. If you look closely, uh, whenever these leftmost channels appear, you can see that there it is. There's one that just passed by. That in fact it has extra spurs that we are not interested in. So that's a little bit uh, in, uh, unusual, and I want to figure out why. By the way, something weird has happened. The uh, the uh, the button that used to say persistence here is gone. I don't know why. What happened to it? That's a little bit unusual. I mean. There you go, it just somehow came back. So there's a, a little bit of a bug in there. I just clicked on it and clicked away and it came back. This this uh, menu had disappeared. So there are some occasional bugs I see in the software which I'm hoping they will fix because it has a lot of potential. But indeed there are some little issues that they, they definitely need to address. But anyhow, so here's, a, here's our spurious tones that we want to investigate. So let's go ahead and look closely at that. I'm going to put my marker over here again. If I can move the marker there, it's marker moving. Uh, for some reason, you cannot grab the marker and move it around. It only jumps to wherever you're clicking. And uh, this is a nice feature to have to be able to just grab this marker and move it around. It will automatically snap to the trace. I hope they implement that because that's what I'm essentially really used to. So here we go. Let's go to center. Now it's going to put that frequency for me in the center. It's still looking at 27 megahertz. Let me reduce that a little bit. Let's perhaps look maybe only up to 10 megahertz or so. And there we go. So here are all of our frequency, uh, different uh, frequency channels, and here's the spurs that we don't want to see. So what I can go is let me go ahead and turn the second uh, trace off. There we go. Let me check track track two. Let me see. Don't update it and clear. There we go. So we are not, we are not updating that trace anymore. So let's go ahead and make some recording again. I'm going to go ahead and say record. I'm going to wait a bit until I see. A couple of these, there you go, I just saw one over here, there it is, I just saw another one. So I can wait for as long as I want and it's continue to record it. And once I'm unsatisfied, I'm going to pause it and it's going to give me the name again. Perfect. Now I'm going to go playback and I'm going to select it and I'll pause it right here. So I can step through this. Now again, looking for 
the anomaly as it appears. Again, remember all of the traces, all of the functionality that you have here, you can apply again. I can go ahead, even though I didn't have this trace enabled while I was recording it, it doesn't matter. I can go update now. Now I can go play it and now you can see, see, it's now enabled again. So let's keep going. Uh huh. There is another one. I still see don't don't see any spurs. Still so far so good. That one's another channel that just appeared. There is another one right next to it. We're gonna continue until we see. Aha! There it is. Look at that. This particular channel causes some problem. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. And let me go back once. Here's another thing that I wish you could do. There we go. Clear. Go away, go away. There we go. That's a little bit unusual. Didn't clear it right away. Anyhow, so now I can uh, disable that again and go back and forth. There. You see that? There is our some of our spurious tones that we don't want to. For some reason, some of the channels have spurs outside of the region of the channel itself, but not all of them. So this one has one. If I go on until I, I catch another one. There we go. Here's another one. Look, the spurs are further out for this particular channel. So some of these channels indeed cause some problems and some of them don't. And this would be a very, very difficult phenomena to catch without the recording and playing back and all the real-time capturing that this particular spectrum analyzer offers. So this is a kind of stuff that I'm talking about that would be very, very tough to otherwise catch. So let's go ahead and stop this and get back out of it and you can see different ones. If I go, the persistence button is gone again, you see? I don't know what is going on with it. So let me go. Once I click on it, it comes back. That's kind of unusual. But anyhow, there it is. You can see that the, the dirty spectrum here uh, whenever we are looking at it. If I go ahead and put it back onto 3D and zoom in here, you should be able to, there it is, you can see them in the center, the, the dirty portions of the spectrum. So there is another problem that we could easily catch using this software and uh, continue doing more and more analysis and this way now you have a time correlated event which you can search for and analyze. So let's dig even deeper into understanding how these packets work. And for that, we can use the zero span mode of this software. What zero span does is that it's going to stick to a particular center frequency and it's going to record for us live data as a function of time. So I can go ahead and go analysis mode and go into zero span and tell it a particular center frequency, let's say 922. 0.35 meg as just an example which would be center of one of the channels and I know that center of the channel from the previous calculations that we did and um, I know that my IF bandwidth of 500 kilohertz is sufficient but I can change the decimation factor to change how much bandwidth I'm going to look at with a decimation of 64 I'm going to look at 500 kilohertz which is perfect let's search for 5 milliseconds at a time which is a sufficiently long amount of time and here I can use the trigger functions so I can tell a trigger on the video which is what is being displayed and I can say trigger whenever the input signal power exceeds let's say minus uh, 20 or uh, maybe that's, that's a little bit too low maybe minus uh, 30 so whenever there's a minus 30 event it's going to capture and record it exactly as you saw so I'm going to go ahead and, and tell it to do a single trigger until I catch a, send, a channel that's centered at the frequency I'm looking for. So it's searching, oh, still not it, there we go, perfect. I caught a, a, a perfect uh, 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 frequency hop. So look at exactly what's happening because it's very, very, very interesting. So the axis here is in time. The axis here is in frequency. And the axis here is also in time. And some of the writings are getting overlapped here. Uh, but anyhow, that's a softer bug that I, that I hope they would fix. So here I'm looking at amplitude, and here is the references in dB, and this is in time. So this tells me at the center frequency, which is the center frequency of the channel that I wanted to look at, which is here, 922.35 megahertz, I have an event that starts here where the trigger happens, and it rises up like that, and stays flat for a certain amount of time, and it, then it falls down. And then you can see another packet starting right after it. And this is a data that is generating, and you can see that the IQ demodulated data, it, it does IQ demodulation, of course, because it's double sideband conversion and so on, even though this uh, type of modulation it's not, but that's okay. Now, one of the things is that I don't know how I can zoom in and here and out 
I couldn't figure it out. I'm sure there is a way, but anyhow, I couldn't figure out how to do it. They need to uh, polish this portion of the software a little bit more to make it more user friendly. But I do have marker capabilities, so I can uh, click on a marker over here and I can move that marker here and I can go uh, marker delta and I can put another marker here and you can see that this packet has a duration of about 3.2 millisecond I'm setting packets of data which are 8 bytes long and it has a certain data rate which I can then calculate based on this observation but I want to look at what type of modulation I'm actually getting and look this is an AMD modulation mode which means it's showing me the amplitude of the signal versus time which is fine and it's flat because it's not doing AM modulation it, it, it kind of launches up the power and rises it slowly and then keeps it flat for a duration and then it collapses it's a little bit interesting that it's doing that I wonder why we're going to be able to find out and you can see that the signal grows with it as the output power signal grows so will do the RQ demodulation and here's the spectrum that I've captured and I can go ahead and go under FM demodulation and I can go ahead and tell the, uh, change the frequency division to let's say uh, 100 kilohertz like so there we go I'm gonna go ahead and try and capture another event and there it is here's a capture event perhaps I can uh, reduce this even further sorry let me go ahead and do 50 kilohertz this is part of kind of uh, experimenting and figuring out what you're trying to look at there we go perfect there it is so uh, let me go back here so we can see it there it is this was our packet I just captured another one and I'm gonna go ahead and FM demodulate version of it and look what we see we see exactly the FM modulated the signal this is now the vertical axis here now is a function of frequency not an amplitude anymore this is frequency versus time and you can see the FM modulation clearly at the beginning there is a pilot and this pilot just ramps the goes one zero one zero one zero which is the data that it wants to transmit jumps between two different frequencies and it ramps up the power slowly and that portion is this portion of the of the curve right over here and once it's done with that then it begins to send my data so you can see this is one frequency hub it has some preamble portion uh, which is uh, which is doing this in order to synchronize the transit and receiver perhaps that's the reason why it's doing that and then it sends our data ones and zeros so beautifully and clearly observed and this is in between the channel in between the frequency hops this is just junk because it's it's not able to the software is not able to tell uh, what is going on is jumping back and forth at different frequencies is making essentially making demodulation mistakes but anyway here is the portion of the data that's relevant if I go to the AM modulation this portion is just the noise of the instrument this portion is the noise of the instrument so naturally the FM demodulated version is gonna be just noise also but you can clearly see a packet look at look at the depth of information that we were able to do we found the total occupied bandwidth we found each channel we found channel bandwidth we found spurious unwanted t tones that we didn't want we found channel timing frequency hopping and now we see exactly what each of the packets looks like in time domain all within one software without changing the setup at all and this is one of the powers of real-time spectrum analysis which only comes to life with software that supports it and even though the software has to be polished it is in a really really good situation position right now be able to give you tons of information and they have to continue to develop it in order to stay competitive with the likes of Tektronix but you can go ahead and see uh, for example here another packet starting you can see the beginning of that packet with the tones being sent but anyhow this will give you a very good idea of what's going on so this is a complete analysis of this radio link now I hope you got good enough information from this I don't want to spend too much more time on it because I have other experiments to show you so let's move to the next one so before we do some experiments with the tracking generator I wanted to look at its performance a little bit on its own now one of the things I noticed or at least as far as I can tell you're not really able to run the control software for the tracking generator unless you have a spectrum analyzer connected to the spike software because if you so launch the spike software and don't have a spectrum analyzer then it doesn't allow you to enable the control functions for this unit which is a little bit unusual I guess they don't really want you to use this as a standalone synthesizer again this is as far as I could tell I couldn't find a way so for now I've connected the tracking generator directly to my Agino synthesizer as I will show you separate from this and this is just sitting there in order to enable the software to run now in order to run both of these at the same time you need really three USB ports you need two for this and one for that you need USB 3.0 for this and USB 2.0 for that so obviously the surface computer is not able to do that and it only has one USB 3.0 port so I have connected these to my desktop computer I'm using a remote desktop software 
to view my computer screen on the surface in order to be able to have everything here in view nice and easily. So if you see this being a little bit sluggish, it's because it's on a remote desktop and it's not running natively on the surface computer on its own. So let's take a look at the control software that uh, comes with the tracking generator and it's really, really basic. Uh, so this is all you basically get. Oops, sorry about that, here we go. This is all you get. So you get a uh, center frequency, a center uh, frequency step and amplitude and a step for the amplitude. Now, the highest amplitude that this unit can provide is minus 10 dBm. And you know, it would be nice if it went to zero dBm, but the, re but, uh, the reason this is a tracking generator again and they claim to have uh, more than 80 dB of dynamic range at this power for measuring passive circuits. So if that's how much dynamic range you get, that's m it's okay for most applications. You probably don't need more than that. Unless you have a really, really lossy passive network, you don't care. And it goes down to minus 30, uh, which is okay again for most applications. But if you have a very, very high gain uh, amplifier that you want to measure, they provide you with a, a 20 dB attenuator that comes uh, that ships with the tracking generator so you can bring this down basically to minus 50 which is then sufficient for most other things that you want to do so they do think of that in advance now one of the other things it doesn't have it doesn't have an enable and disable output so the output is always enabled as soon as you connect it which is unusual I wonder why they don't just have, an, uh, have a capability of disabling the output. I'm sure that's something they can add. And furthermore, this uses a DDS, direct digital synthesis architecture with multipliers and doublers and so on afterwards to reach 12.4 gigahertz. So you're gonna get harmonics coming out of this. And these harmonics are somewhat making it unsuitable to be used as a standalone synthesizer, but it is certainly sufficient for using in a tracking generator architecture where most of the time the harmonics that you're looking at are outside of the bandwidth of the spectrum analyzer anyway. And that's what they're counting on. Most of the tracking generators uh, in instruments typically are like that. They're gonna have harmonics that you don't want. So here I'm generating a 500 megahertz signal at an output of minus 10 dBm. You can see there's a little bit extra loss in the cable that I've connected. The amplitude accuracy isn't critical as long as it is you know, within a dB or so of what it's supposed to be. And that's because you're gonna normalize your waveform afterwards anyway in a tracking generator uh, architecture and you don't care so much. But here you go, you can see 500 megahertz. And the accuracy of the frequency here is limited on what is being displayed because of the large span of the spectrum analyzer. But I can go ahead and increase the frequency. Let's go to there we go, let's go to one gigahertz. There it is in one gigahertz and you can see all the harmonics shift around and that's normal from a DDS multiplier uh, architecture. Right now it's probably running directly from the DDS. But anyhow, we can go up higher. Let's go all the way to five gigahertz. There we go, you can see. Now you have subharmonics and again, it looks good. The power is still okay and there's some extra loss in the cable and that's normal. Let's go all the way up to, let's say 12 gigahertz. And actually, let's go all the way to 12.25. There you go, this is our 12.25. Now, something interesting I, I noticed uh, while I was playing around with this is that you notice it says 12.4 gigahertz. But if I go to the software, the software says 12.25 gigahertz. And the reason for that is because it actually maxed out, but it doesn't take that into account in the center frequency uh, when it is maxed out, it, it still says 12.25. This is a small bug that they need to fix. So if I go ahead in here and enter the value of 12.25 again, it's going to have to, let me just put a different number. Let's put, let's say 12 gigahertz. And then it corrects it. And if I go back to the spectrum analyzer, you can see that's correct. It's just a little bug in the in the software that they're going to have to fix. So let's go ahead and take a, a closer look at this signal by zooming in a little bit more. So I can go in here, the frequency and set the center frequency to 12 gigahertz and set the reduce the span here for us. And 200 megahertz span, that's a 50 megahertz span. And 20 megahertz span, let's do a peak search. Let's reduce the resolution bandwidth of this guy to as low as I can go. There we go. So you can see a reasonably nice clean tone. I can go ahead and change the span further. There we go. So this is a five megahertz span. These are the scores from the synthesizer itself. Again, the absolute phase noise isn't critical for a tracking generator. It's mostly important for a synthesizer because a tracking generator is only going to, only going to look at the center frequency in conjunction with the spectrum analyzer as it's sweeping. So it's not critical to have a very, very uh, good phase noise. But this is, a, again, this is a 12 gigahertz signal coming out. So I'm pretty happy with it. So while you can, one another, other thing we can do is we can actually go ahead and uh, re disconnect it and connect it back to the input 
of the circuit itself. So let me set that back to a one gigahertz tone. And I'm going to go ahead and disconnect this cable from up here and connect it directly to the input of the of its the, the spectrum analyzer by itself. There we go. And we should be able to adjust that. So now we're putting too much signal into the spectrum analyzer here. So let's go ahead and change the level to zero dBm. There we go. And we should see a fairly clean tone such as this. There we go. You can see all the different harmonics showing up. So you can basically connect it back to the input of itself and, and measure it. And, and uh, this is a typical thing if you want to quickly see that it is at the right frequency and so on. You can see all the harmonics being displayed. And another one of the features of the software is its ability to measure harmonics directly from the spectrum that is being displayed. And if you go under analysis mode and go under harmonic viewer, then you get that capability where it divides the screen into bins and then but depending on which frequency you tell it, it's going to measure harmonics of that frequency. So I can go ahead and set the center frequency, for example, here to one gigahertz, like so. And there it is, and it automatically tells me, okay, your fundamental power is here, which is minus 10 dBm, which is correct, your second harmonic, third harmonic, fourth and fifth harmonic, and uh, it basically collects them into bins, allowing you to quickly see the performance of the circuit across various harmonics. This is a use, very useful tool if you want to uh, quickly be measuring something as you adjust, for example, some amplifier parameters and uh, observe the THD as you go along. Anyhow, enough of that. Let's go ahead and measure some uh, microwave filters directly into tracking mode operation. So in order to use the tracking generator in conjunction with the spectrum analyzer, we have to lock them at the back with the synchronization cable, which I've done. It comes with a synchronization cable that's much longer than this. This is the one that I had in my lab that I'm using. And of course, I, here I've made a through from the output of the tracking generator to the input of the spectrum analyzer with a through here in the middle, uh, which we're going to use to normalize and calibrate the waveform. And I'm interested to afterwards to measure the performance of this microwave tunable bandpass filter, which can be tuned from something close to about 1.5 gigahertz all the way up to 3 gigahertz. So we're going to try and focus somewhere, let's say, around two and a half gigahertz and see what happens and we can see it live being tuned around and in order to do that I have connected the input and the output of the analyzer as I mentioned and we can see that the curve is reasonably flat this is the raw data being measured and the instrument gives you a couple of options for example so let me uh, center this a little bit better here so we can take a closer look so at the very top left here you can see the controls of this particular set of applications that you can do. So you can have a sweep size of about, I've set it to about 100 points, which from uh, DC to 6 gigahertz will take about 1.7 seconds of sweep time. And here you can tell it that this is a passive device so that it sets the output power to minus 10 dBm. And then you can tell it that, you know, it has a, a whether you have added a 20 dB pad or not and so on. So I can go ahead and set the frequency range I'm interested in. Let's say I'm interested in looking from a frequency of about 2 gigahertz to a frequency of about, let's say, 3 gigahertz. So that's my range now, and you can see that it's sweeping that range in 480 millisecond here shown at the bottom, and I can go ahead and say store through, and then it will basically normalize it perfectly now. You don't see it anymore because it's, it's perfectly behind the axis line at the top. So now let's go ahead and connect it to our microwave filter. So I'm going to go ahead and disconnect the output of the analyzer or of the tracking generator connected to one of the inputs of my filter like so. And I'm going to go ahead and remove the through. So the error in this measurement is essentially the, the loss of the through, which is now counted twice. There we go. And now if you go back over here, we can clearly see the response of the filter, which is very nice. And you can see a very large dynamic range. Our, our noise, the noise floor would be here, so this is even larger uh, than the system, uh, than the measurement. Uh, the, the, basically, we're not saturating the dynamic range of the instrument yet because we have even more dynamic range than what is being displayed here. And if I go ahead and tool the filter manually, I can tune it up like so. I can tune it down, and I can go all the way to 2 gigahertz. You can see that now the sender is there. Now let me go back to two and a half gigahertz. And I can go and put a marker on this. So I click over here and it puts me 
a marker, let's say right there, two and a half gigahertz, you can see that at two and a half gigahertz, the insertion loss of the filter is essentially non-existent. It's minus 0 0.07, and I can go ahead and do a delta marker and find out, for example, let's say at the delta of 200 and let's say 50 megahertz, we are already 38 dB down. So this filter rejects 38 dB at a window of about plus or minus 250 megahertz at a center frequency. And we can also do other things. I can remove the delta, for example. I can put the marker over here and we can see the band pass, for example, of the filter's performance. So it has about a band pass window of a 1 dB drop of about, let's say, 80 megahertz or so. So it's for a particular application, which is interesting. But again, it's very nice. You can see the live tuning capability of this instrument is, is, is quite nice and uh, I'm very happy with it. And just to show you that we have quite a bit of dynamic range to spare, I have added another 20 dB attenuator uh, in series with one of the inputs of the microwave filter and we can see the shape is entirely unaffected here. And we can see now if I look at the if I do a single measurement, if I get rid of the delta and put a single measurement here, you can see now it says minus 20.47. So it's adding the insertion loss on top of the loss of the filter, uh, on, on top of the loss of the attenuator itself, but it still has full dynamic range of the entire curve. So it has no problem representing. You can see even when I go all the way to the right, you can see at the very, very bottom here, we are sitting at a huge, huge dynamic range. You can put the marker here. It says minus 85. Remember, our reference is zero. So from this point to the reference point is, is 85 dB of dynamic range, and it has no problem meeting that dynamic range. And if I go all the way to the left here, again, you can see that the drop here, all the way we are able to measure uh, down to here, which is, again, another minus 88 dB or so. So it certainly has the large dynamic range. So even though it, it doesn't have more than zero dBm of Apple power, for most applications, such a large dynamic range would definitely be sufficient. So for the next thing I want to do is I want to characterize uh, another instrument that I have received. And I thought it would be cool to measure this combination of active-passive uh, circuit together, which would be interesting to see. So the next thing I want to measure is this EMC probe set from techbox.net, which is a, a really nice product I've been using for some time, and I'll perhaps review it uh, later on. But for now, I want to do some characterization in some of the components that, uh, that it comes with. For example, it comes with this broadband amplifier from 3 megahertz to 3 gigahertz, uh, which has a, you know, a certain frequency response and so on. Well, you know, with a tracking generator, we can measure, make a scalar measurement of this amplifier by itself. And then I'm interested in putting a setup together where we can have a, a node where we can monitor directly and catch the center frequency, a broadband center frequency from 3 megahertz to 3 gigahertz of the, one of these probes for a pin that is radiating power into open open space. So it's like a free space measurement as a function of the location of the probe with respect to the pin. So we can move the probe around and see exactly what the frequency response looks like, which would be a very interesting uh, measurement for this particular product. So let's go ahead and first do a very simple measurement. Let's measure the frequency response of this amplifier. We should have quite a bit of uh, gain. It's almost 40 dB of gain in this. So it's a very uh, high gain um, high bandwidth or reasonably high bandwidth high gain amplifier which would be a good candidate for characterizing the signal hound tracking generator spectrum analyzer so let me set that up so for measuring just the gain of this amplifier i've added a 20 db attenuator that comes with the tracking generator at the output before i make the the through connection i've also added a, a 10 db attenuator directly at the output of the amplifier to make sure that i am within the dynamic range of the spectrum analyzer itself and in the optimum uh, condition. So there it is. I've set everything up, and in the software itself, I'm setting it to. I'm telling the software that I'm measuring an active circuit, and that will automatically adjust the the tracking generator's output level to uh, not exceed the dynamic range of the amplifier itself. So it's going to go to the lower output power. You can see I've done that already, and I can go ahead and store the through response, and it's going to store it here on on a zero level there for me. And now I can go ahead and take it out and put the amplifier. Uh, the input so let's go ahead and remove the output of the tracking generator remove it through from the circuit once again and of course connect the output of the amplifier first as you should always do just to make sure to protect the amplifier and then we take the input of the tracking generator and connect it directly to the amplifier's input and then we should be able to see the frequency response of the amplifier and in fact we do and here it is here is the response of our amplifier 
it looks good. It's exactly what it should look like based on the data sheet of the part itself. And I can go ahead and measure its 3 dB bandwidth. So I can put my marker here at 40 megahertz and it says 30, which means that I'm including my own 10 dB attenuator, I have a gain of 40 dB at very low frequency above 40 megahertz, which is correct. And we're gonna put a delta marker and I'm gonna move the delta marker forward until we see about minus 3 dB. There it is, which is about 2 gigahertz, which is again also correct. And that's exactly what we should see. But anyhow, this is less interesting than measuring the response of the circuit in the free space experiment. Just one thing to note that when I measure the bandwidth of this amplifier, it includes the bandwidth limitation of these decoupling caps and this attenuator as well. And it includes that into the bandwidth limitation of the amplifier. So the amplifier actually has a little bit more bandwidth, but it is somewhat limited by this as well. It's something to keep in mind in your setup. So here's the setup of our next experiment. Here I'm interested in capturing the radiation pattern uh, to the EMC probe here. So what I've done is that I've taken the output of the tracking generator and the output of the tracking generator simply goes to this pin over here and this pin will act as a radiation point. It's like an omnidirectional antenna but it's not tuned to any particular frequency and it's very short. So it's just a little pin sticking out and if you bring a probe near it it's going to couple to the probe and of course both electromagnetically and capacitively depending on the distance and so on and it's going to transfer some energy to the probe tips. And I'm, in I'm interested in figuring out what that looks like as a function of frequency depending on the location of the probe. So then I take the output of the probe and I feed it into the amplifier and the output of the amplifier then goes back onto our spectrum analyzer. And this is our loop. So the energy sent by the tracking generator is radiated out, captured by the probe, amplified and back onto the uh, spectrum analyzer. Now if you look at the screen right now, and I hope you can see that because I want to capture both of these at the same time. You can clearly see uh, the waveform here. You can see that the va waveform value is really low. This is minus 30 dB here. So there's almost no coupling and that's because this distance is quite large. But look what happens if I bring the probe close to the EMC probe. You can see as I bring it closer, you can see now we go, look, now we have a whole bunch of coupling. And I'm sitting very, very close to it. And now you can see the exact frequency response of this loop, which is determines the frequency response of the pin coupled to the tip of this probe. And this is an E-plane probe. And you can see that at this distance, we have this type of frequency response. And this is a really broadband frequency response. At higher frequencies, we have more coupling. And that's true. That should, that's how it should be. And you can see that this is our 0 dB line. So we're recovering all the loss of the free space path between those two points. And this actually... Uh, not far field actually, it's near field at this point, but anyhow, uh, you can see that uh, clearly the, the, the uh, frequency response. And if I go ahead and, and, and move this probe around, you can see the, the distance, the difference between the frequency response. So if I put the probe tip in front of it, we're going to get a very, very similar frequency response because this is a, a fairly uh, equidistant point I'm moving. And if I move it a little bit further, of course, you can see that the whole frequency response drops, but it's reasonably flat and that's important because this allows you to capture signals on a PCB using these probes, for example, which is what they're intended to, is one of the applications and of course catch any um, emissions that you may not want to have. And I can go ahead and continue to move this around and get an idea of exactly what type of frequency response to expect. And you can see at this distance here we have a peak here which means that there is a certain frequency which has a better transmission. It's a complex system because many many things happen. There is interaction between the field and the metal piece that I've connected here and it's an interesting example to see uh, what happens in a system like this. And you can also, of course go ahead and turn the probe on to on by 90 degrees and again capture the waveform. You can see still we have a nice broadband frequency response and I can move the probe around and I can see the difference in the frequency response. So this is a this is this particular probe is intended to give you a nice flat response, but we can go ahead and pick up a different probe, and I'm gonna pick a different one and replace it, and then we can take a look at how that frequency response looks like. And here's another example, this time using an H-plane probe and the pin is right in the center of the probe and you can see the frequency response uh, the way it looks. And as I bring the probe closer to the edges of this circular uh, opening, you can see the frequency response changes quite a bit. And this doesn't have such a nice uniform frequency response anymore. It has nulls and notches that happen uh, in, in the band. And you can go ahead and analyze and you know figure out exactly what the cause of it is and, and try and solve the electromagnetic field that's caused by this and the interaction capacitively and electromagnetically between the probe and the tip of the SMA cable that's coming out. So this is just a basic example. I wanted to give you an idea of, of one of the crazy things you can do in, in with the tracking generator. And I think this is a cool experiment. Again, for the interest of time, I just wanted to quickly give you an idea and move on to the next experiment. 
And of course, given that we have a tracking generator, we can also measure return loss. And we can do that by using an external coupler. So in this situation, in this setup, what I've done is that I've taken the output of the tracking generator, putting it at the input of the coupler. The output of the coupler is connected to whatever we want to measure the return loss of, and the return path is connected to the spectrum analyzer. So this configuration is very common using a tracking generator and a spectrum analyzer to measure return loss. This is basically the magnitude, a scalar measurement, not a vector measurement. So the idea here is that any reflected power that's coming back from the due to impedance mismatch at the device under test will then get coupled onto uh, the coupled port of the coupler into the spectrum analyzer. So what I'm going to measure, well, I'm interested in measuring this, this antenna. This is a, a mystery antenna because I have no idea what its frequency of operation is. And you can't always tell by the size of the antenna what the frequency of operation is. For example, I have another antenna over here, and this antenna is at 5.8 gigahertz, and it's exactly the same as this one. I happen to know that this is indeed not a 5.8 gigahertz antenna, even though they look essentially identical. So why, can I, um, why is it that I can measure an antenna in this way? Well, if you think about it, the antenna is designed to radiate power at a certain frequency and it is matched to characteristic impedance, for example, in this case 50 ohm, at that frequency. This means that any power coming at that frequency, once it enters the antenna, it will radiate out um, away from the antenna and it will not get reflected back. Any power that's reflected back at the antenna is not getting radiated and therefore would not be a very good antenna. So in this case, we're going to connect it to the output of our coupler here and then any power that's reflected back we can measure and whenever there is a null meaning whenever this is well matched to 50 ohms that will be the operational frequency of this particular antenna so let's go ahead and, and, and try that experiment so I've already done everything and you can see that I have already calibrated the system so we have a flat line over here so it's pretty straightforward and I'm going to go ahead and attach our mystery antenna to this port over here here we go And there it is, and I'm going to bend it like it is designed to be, like that. I'm going to kind of leave it like that in the air. And now we can take a look at the frequency response, and we can clearly see a dip in the return power. And that is the frequency in which the antenna is able to radiate power. And I can go ahead and put a marker on that right in the center here, and you can see it says 2.5, and that's exactly where this antenna is supposed to be. This antenna is supposed to work from... Uh, something around close to about 2.4 gigahertz so from here you can see at 2.4 gigahertz the return loss is already better than minus 10 and if I put a delta I can put the other marker on an equal value over there you can see this antenna has roughly about a bandwidth of about 220 megahertz covering the ISM band and that's exactly what this antenna is intended to do but here's something interesting and this is some something that might be familiar to you know, iPhone users when the or iPhone with the body antennas came out and if you hold the iPhone in a particular way you can see that you lose reception and that's because the characteristic impedance of the antenna changes and it doesn't behave like a good antenna anymore. So let me go ahead for example and hold this antenna in my head and look at what happens to the waveform. It completely shifted. It's not centered at the same frequency anymore. So we are changing the characteristic impedance of the antenna by holding it in our hand. That's because of course the capacitive effects of the conductive uh, part of my body and this antenna completely messing up its frequency response. So by, by holding the antenna in a certain uh, position in your hand, it can completely mess up its frequency response, as you can see. And this is one of the reasons why it's important to design antennas in consumer electronics in such a way where it's not in contact with the human body, as you can clearly see the impact of it over here. All right, so I just wanted to give you a quick idea that you can indeed measure return loss and you know, characterize antennas, for example, like this, which would be pretty interesting. And I uh, have one more experiment I want to show you, and that has to do with constellation and modulation, and that would be it. So as our last experiment, I want to show you some demodulation capability of these two units. On the left, we are demodulating a 16 qualm signal at 10 million symbols per second, 2048 symbols, with a root raised cosine coefficient of 0.22. The center frequency is 2.4 gigahertz, and it's an identical signal being demodulated on the Tektronix RSA 306. Now, the demodulation capability of the software uh, of the signal hound is free, uh, but it's very limited in a sense. I mean, it can show you up to 16 qualm constellation and a few other different constellations, but the most complex one is 16 qualm. It gives you the t table and EVM right now is saying it, it has an EVM of 3.3%. But other than that, it is fairly limited in what else it can give you. The demodulation software of the Tektronix RSA 306 is, is in a 
to an entirely different league because it gives you far more information than just a simple constellation but of course it's not free so you know you have this again an advantage and disadvantage uh, you get some simple demodulation capability here but this, the, the signal view software from Tektronix is, is a really an industry professional software intended for serious project uh, and product development the uh, signal the spike software from signal hand is an amazing software to be uh, provided for free but it is something that continues to grow and it has to uh, it has many many missing features which of course have to be added for it to be become competitive to the equivalent version of the signal view for example with signal view you can go all the way to 256 quam you have equalization which is a very very important parameter which is not built into um, uh, the signal hound software and a whole bunch of other capabilities which I've shown in my other video when I reviewed the 306 but nonetheless it is important to know that these guys are um, uh, the, the spike software is advancing very quickly adding all these features which you didn't have before and I'm very happy to see that making these much more productive just as a side note the EVM reported by the Tektronix um, RSA is actually less than 3% is about 2.8% or so and the EVM reported by uh, Spike software here is about 3.3% that's interesting and it's a uh, perhaps has to do with the larger dynamic range of the the, the Tektronix soft uh, Tektronix RSA 306 where you're getting a slightly better EVM but anyhow nonetheless you can see some comparison between these two I hope that now you have a fairly good idea of the differences between these two units and uh, yeah let's continue on well, I hope that you enjoyed the experiment. So the question is, which one should you buy? Should you buy the Signal Hound or the Tektronix? Well, only you can answer that. All I can show you is the differences between the units through the experiments that you've seen, and both of these have had their own episodes of reviews. So the, the Signal Hound is actually cheaper. It's about $600 cheaper, but it offers a lower dynamic range. It has a slightly lower, uh, worse noise uh, floor, but it does have better harmonic performance. It has a 27 megahertz of analysis panel as opposed to 40 megahertz from the Tektronix. So if your application is 40 megahertz, then you really don't have much of a choice. All the software options of the signal hand are free, but the software options for the Tektronix, particularly the advanced demodulation techniques and other uh, particular um, features that software provides are not free, but they are far more advanced and far more capable than what the signal hand software offers. At the same time, the Tektronix one has more rugged build, it has a better USB connector, and it records raw data directly to your hard drive, so when you're going to play it back, you have better visibility into the spectrum. The signal hand has overlapping FFT, so it can potentially catch signals that are even smaller than 100 microseconds, but if you record them and play them back, you're only going to get what you recorded and you saw the first time, and you cannot get more insight like the Tektronix one will provide you if you record them. Uh, the, another advantage of the signal hand is that it, it works with a tracking generator. There is no such thing currently uh, for the Tektronix RSA. Maybe that will be in the future, but there isn't one right now. And the API that's written for the signal hand can talk to multiple signal hand units at the same time, but the API for uh, the Tektronix one can only talk to one of them at the same time. This guy can run from a single USB 3.0 connector. This guy needs two connectors. So if you need more power, this needs more power to run. So if you only have one connector, this is going to be a little bit more difficult to use. They both have GPS data. This guy uses the GPS data a little bit better. Perhaps it's something that Tektronix will implement in the future. At the end, it really is up to you what would fit your application. Of course, the pr price plays a really important role. The, the software for the signal hand has a little bit of a few bugs here and there, but it is continuously improving. And they, it seems that they do listen to their customers and they will improve the software and the new versions come along. For example, just during this review, I went through two versions of it as they updated regularly. So that's definitely an advantage to consider. All I can tell you is that both of these units are very, very good. And they both have quite a bit of capability. Really, at the end, it boils down to your decision. So maybe you can leave it in the comment so that people know what you think. And if I miss something, please share with everybody else. If you do happen to buy one of these from either of the manufacturers, let them know that it might be because you saw my review. I get none of the profits and I get none of the portions of the sales. This is just so that I can have a good relationship with the manufacturers and they know that there is a good interaction between my videos and the viewers and their customers. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time.